Hey there friends, Dave Politis, can Am Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. Thanks for being here. This is another amnesia segment, and they keep getting stranger. Now, a lot of comments recently about this, and number one, YouTube still has not responded to why people are getting unsubscribed or why you're not getting notified. Now this has been ramped up not from me. There's a partnership program that all content providers have to belong to. That's kind of your uh, middleman between myself and YouTube. That partnership, that partner of mine, has some serious horsepower. And they go straight to YouTube engineers, etc. I've gotten a couple notes from them. And they seem, to me at least, to be a bit frustrated. And that's a good sign. They're surprised that they weren't getting answers, but they said they were still trying. I don't know what that means. But at this point, there have been thousands of you that have told me that you've been unsubscribed. And then almost an equal number have told me that you're not notified when a new video comes up. So if you couple those two factors, that is the total destruction of a channel. I know some of you said, yeah, other channels have had the same thing. I don't really care about anybody else. I care about me. And if if it's systematic, if they're targeting certain sites, I'd like to know who and why and who's making those decisions. I don't understand it, but this is why I move the news to rumble. If you Google David Politis presents missing 411, the factual news, start it with rumble, comma, David Politis, presents Missing 411 Factual News, you'll find it on Rumble. And we're getting a lot of great comments, great feedback, and we're talking about a lot of hot issues. So I encourage you to watch it. Now on this segment, we've had almost a 30 to 40% drop off in viewership within days. I think it's almost impossible. And I've had some people look at it that say, Dave, this makes no sense. And I've still played some trucking videos where we've looked into it. And then the amnesia cases, maybe it's just me, but I think they're just as intriguing as the truckers videos. And to have that steep of a drop off that quickly, I've never seen anything like it. And yeah, it's frustrating to me because I know that myself and my guys here are just working their tails off getting intriguing cases for you. But we'll still keep plugging away. But just to let you know, I'm very, very, very frustrated. Very. I can't even tell you how frustrated I am, but I am. All right, let's start with the cases. How many people here have been to Hawaii? Yeah, I've been lucky enough to have been, been. I've been to Oahu several times. I've been to Maui several times. First time I was in Oahu was for my friend Gordon Silva, police officers. When he was killed, his family lived in Hawaii and I was sent there to do the funeral services for him. It wasn't a fun trip, but I did see a part of Hawaii from a Hawaiian perspective, which was I'll always cherish that. Cranston and Vicki Kamaka, if anybody knows them out there, you tell them I said hi, I miss them. They're great people. Uh, first case involves a young man named Carl Cody, 29 years old. Went missing April 5th, 1981 at about 11.30 a.m. He was a resident of Pasadena, California, 
and he was single and engaged. He was employed by a company called Comark Commodities, and he was a lawyer and a broker. He was an intellect. He was vacationing in Oahu with fellow broker Barry Reed, and they were staying at the Outrigger Hotel on Waikiki Beach. Well, I've done exactly this before, and you can only take Waikiki so long and then you have to get out of the chaos of the downtown and the beach and it's quite a scene but it's not really quiet peaceful rural Hawaii so what they did is they rented a car and on April 5th and they drove out to a spot called Yokohama Bay and they rented some scuba diving equipment and they went diving in the bay I've done that in Hawaii it's I can't tell you what it's like. It's like diving in a bathtub filled with gorgeous fish. It's just unbelievable. First time I was there, I just couldn't believe that this place existed. Uh, but they went scuba diving. Now, where did they go? So, this is Makua Beach. This is the bay they were diving in right here. Waialua, right there. Waikiki be over here. Here's the Makaha Valley. This area right here is pretty remote. Not a lot of people. You've really gone to the full extent of trying to get away when you get over here. So I'm sure that it was pretty quiet. They were alone. They were having a good time. Well, the guys went diving. And you're not going to dive very deep there. I mean, you might get down to 30 feet or something. But everybody said that this day was perfect. There was no wind. There was no big surge. There weren't big waves. It was calm. It's beautiful. So they get there about 10 o'clock. They dive. They get out about 11. Take all the gear off. And Barry tells Carl, he goes, hey, I'm tired. I'm going to take a nap. I know exactly how he feels. I've been diving since I was 12 years old. After a dive, you just, it's like a total massage. You just feel like laying down and sleeping. <laughs> and uh, I know what Barry was thinking. Well, Carl was so jazzed to be there. He took off his mask and snorkel and his fins. He goes, hey, I'm just going to go snorkeling off right off the water here. And uh, Barry said, okay. So Barry laid down at about 11. Wakes up at 11.30. Picks his head up, looks around. There's nobody anywhere. Nobody anywhere. And he looks and Carl's equipment isn't next to him. It's still gone. And Barry's trying to figure out, well, where did he go? Because I can see everything. It's dead calm. This isn't right. So he walks down the beach a couple hundred yards, looks some more, comes back, goes a hundred yards up the beach the other way. He goes, something's wrong. So he gets in his car and he drives a couple miles until he can get to a phone and he calls Honolulu, well, Hawaii Fire Rescue. And they arrive. Barry explains what happened. And they immediately call for a helicopter. And they call for their water unit to respond. And both did. And they searched for a half a day. Up and down the coast. On the boat. The captain of the fire department even said that they could not have had a more perfect day to search. He said from the air... You could see the bottom of the water everywhere. He said if there was a body there, they would have seen it. And they were, this is their words, they were mystified by the disappearance. Okay, you see where we're going with this. So, late that night, they call off the search and they tell Barry that they'll be back the next day. 
Barry goes back to his hotel and calls Carl's parents. And he knew him personally because they'd worked together. And his parents lived in Saudi Arabia and his dad was a pilot for Saudi Airlines. And they said, okay, we're going to make arrangements. If he's not fine tomorrow, we're coming out the next day, April 6th. Barry goes back, explains everything to search and rescue, and they go through the whole search episode again. Water, land, air. It was a full-fledged search effort. Everybody believed, everyone believed, that Carl was in the water. But what they didn't understand is what was the triggering mechanism for him to be there. There was no big waves. There was no weather issues. Again, puzzling. But search, they're doing everything right in Hawaii. They're searching like they should. Again, they search the whole day, nothing. Barry goes back to the hotel. Another sleepless night. Comes back again the next day. And on April, the search goes on until April 8th. They don't find anything. The next day, April 9th. Carl's mom and dad arrive from Saudi Arabia. First thing his dad does is run a helicopter and flies it out to the bay and tells the helicopter pilot, just fly a grid pattern over the, over the bay. We're going to look for my son. Later on that day, they meet with the rescuers, rescuers at the fire department and Mr. Cody has, his name is Dave Cody, has the rescuers explain what they did and what they did or didn't find. They didn't find anything. And the rescuers told them it didn't make any sense because everything was perfect. Perfect. Well, Barry didn't know this. Obviously, the fire guys didn't know this, but Dave Cody tells a story that when Carl was in high school, he suffered a bad concussion. And it gave him amnesia, and it took him four months to recover from it. Best of his knowledge, he's never had it since, and he doesn't understand why, what would be a triggering mechanism now, because Again, there's no surges in the water, no big waves, so nothing to bounce you around and hit your head on something. Again, nothing. So, April 9th, Dad arrives. From the 10th to the 14th, there were a series of volunteers and firefighters and friends and family that were arriving. And 100 people were searching for Cody on the island, around the hotel, around the bay, and on the villages around the bay, just in case he got out and wandered around. They got nothing. They had pictures of him that his dad brought that were... This is one of the photos that showed up. Cody was super smart. Super smart. So I would classify this as an intellect case. And if you've been following Missing 411, you know what I mean by that. It's also a water case. So, four days search of the island, they don't find anything. People start to depart. On April 16th, something triggered inside of Cody. And he said he woke up on the island, didn't know where, and he just remembered a phone number. He later said, I don't even know who the phone number was for. But something just told me to call it. So he calls the phone number, and it's his fiance in Pasadena, California. And they're talking on the phone, and the fiance recognizes his voice and says, Hey, how are you? And he goes, Who are you? And she goes, Well, I'm your fiance. He goes, You are? And she says, Where are you? And he goes, I don't know. Well, make a long story short, they figure out where he was at, Hawaii. And she says, okay, you make your way to Honolulu Airport. Honolulu Airport. 
you get on an American Airlines flight tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock and there'll be a ticket there waiting for you. You grab the ticket, you're going to be flying to LAX, LA International Airport, and I will meet you there. It will be okay. So Cody had the wherewithal at this point to say, okay, this person has my best interests in heart and I'm going to make it somehow or another. He makes it from wherever he's at to Honolulu Airport, gets on the flight on April 17th, and he steps off the plane at LAX and he's described as dirty, unshaven, and he didn't recognize his fiance. She walked up to him, gave him a big hug. He didn't know who she was. And he wasn't right. And his fiance took him immediately to Huntington General Hospital. That night, Cody's dad arrived right after that. On April 19th, Cody's dad gave an interview to the press. And he stated that his son had swelling on the brain. But doctors thought he was going to recover without surgery. And his dad said he doesn't remember much about Hawaii at all. From the time he got there to the time he left, he doesn't remember much. Now, the swelling on the brain, we've talked about this before in these cases. What, what causes that? Because the doctors couldn't find any injury for him, any recent injury. Now, the Honolulu Star Bulletin, in the last article about Cody, said something that I would say to you. This is the quote from their newspaper, the last line. The mystery still remains, however. What had young Cody been doing for the last two weeks of his vacation? ka -ching. There's the biggest question of them all, folks. How did he survive? What did he drink? What did he eat? Who took care of him? This is, this is really the epitome of each one of these cases. How did these people survive? Especially as vulnerable as Cody was in the condition he had been in. How did he even make it around? And then the question I had, some of you will say, well, this is stupid, Dave. Well, he's wearing a bathing suit and he had mask and fins and a snorkel. Where'd all that gear go? Just saying. They said he was wearing khaki pants. Never said where they were dirty, really dirty. They never said where the pants came from and whose pants they were. So that's Carl Cody. Next case. Follows a young man named Jason Hanks, 19 years old disappeared on May 30th, 1982 from Louisiana. He was married, had a one-year-old infant son. As an occupation, he was a siding contractor and the person he worked for stated he was a hard worker, diligent, everything good to say about a young 19-year-old man. Well, he was a resident of Morgan City slash Bayou Vista. That's what it said. And on May 30th, he went fishing with his wife at Wax Lake Outlet at the Calumet Cut. It was described as a deep, swift moving river that went right to the Gulf of California. I mean, Gulf of Mexico. So as an indicator, here's New Orleans. Here's Wax Lake Outlet, and that goes out to the Gulf of Mexico. 
and it's in the Atchafalaya Delta, right here. And there's the Gulf. So they're fishing, and his wife's name's Leslie. And they're fishing about 100 yards apart. And his wife just casually looks down there one time and doesn't see her husband. She'd been looking down there the whole time, and then all of a sudden, boom, he's gone. She just goes, that's weird. She goes walking down there. And she, what she does is she finds Jason's fishing line all strewn up in a tree. And on the ground are some personal items and a soft drink he was drinking. But he's not anywhere to be seen. So she decides to walk upstream a bit, doesn't see him, walks downstream, doesn't see him, looks around the bank of the river, doesn't see anything unusual like bank breaking away or him skidding into the water, nothing like that. But she said there was no place for him to go because she could see for a long distance. It was a delta, it's flat. Well, she ends, up, she ends up calling the parish sheriff. It's like the county sheriff. Well, the sheriff comes out to the scene, talks to Leslie, and then walks the bank like she did. And the sheriff told her, well, it looks like Jason probably fell in the river, got washed out to the Gulf. I hate to say that to you, but that's what it looks like. And she goes, I know, it looks that way, huh? So he calls out for more reinforcements. And he calls for a helicopter from the Coast Guard to go downstream towards the Gulf of Mexico and search and see if they could find a body. It got dark. Leslie had to go home. She went home without her husband. May 31st there was a massive search for Jason. The sheriff put divers in the water at two different locations. He had people pulling the, dragging the bottom of the river, trying to find a body. They weren't finding anything. There were some other fishermen that were in the area originally, and they put a request out in the paper to see if anyone saw anything. Nobody saw anything. Nobody had seen Jason. It made big news in Louisiana. June 1st, divers back in the water. Coast Guard helicopter up, people dragging the river bottom. They're not finding anything. Leslie's getting scared. She's a young bride, married to a young man. They've got a young family. She's going home without her husband each night. Sheriff's not giving her a lot of hope. He explained that these kind of things happen in Louisiana. There's a lot of water. Well, they searched for two more days, June 2nd through the 4th. And on these kind of things, they're looking for loose stuff. Shoes, clothes, handkerchief, seeing if anybody heard any screams, looking for any witnesses, etc. Towels, maybe. Well, on that last day, the sheriff stated that they're gonna presume Jason is drowned. Now that's a hard pill to swallow because that's pretty terminal. When somebody says that, presumption is drowned, presumption is they're dead. And for a young person, I think it's a lot harder to swallow that pill than an older person. Been around the block, we know death is something we have to live with. In this case, very young people, and one of them's gone. Well, that was on June 4th. Almost two weeks later, 12 days later, I imagine Leslie's trying to get used to the fact she's not gonna have a husband anymore. And Jason's family's notified, and they're they're whacked out. 
On June 16th, 60 miles northwest of the fishing spot, Jason walks into the Lafayette, Poli Lafayette Police Station wearing the same clothes he was wearing when he disappears. He says, I need help. So here's where they were fishing at the outlet. And he's found up here in Lafayette at the police station. It's about 60 miles, give or take 10 miles. The police officer that interviews him says, what do you mean you don't remember anything? And he says, the only thing I remember is waking up in a ditch. Well, that's pretty enlightening to me. I've, I've heard this before on amnesia cases. They wake up in a ditch. Remember, missing 411, the UFO connection. Carl woke up sliding down a hillside that he was dropped at. Well, they were interviewing Jason, and he didn't know his name, didn't know where he was from, didn't know where he ate or slept. He did say he remembered that last night he slept in a doorway somewhere in the city. Police said he had about a four-day growth of beard, $5 in his pocket, and his shoes were filthy. And he complained his head was hurting. Well, the officer that's interviewing him calls for a supervisor because they're trying to determine what they're going to do with Jason. He didn't commit a crime. Supervisor comes in and goes, hmm, could it be? He knew about the day's disappearance of Jason Hanks. And he thought, well, I think this might be him. And they started to put the case together. So they call the sheriff and in the county where Jason disappeared, he forwards over all the information about the missing person. And they call Jason's wife. And they said, describe your husband. Does he have any marks, scars? She explains and they said, I think we've got him here. Well, his wife calls his sister and his boss because they're all really tight. And they all drive out to Lafayette to get him. They walk in and he didn't recognize anybody. His sister, his wife, his boss. The sheriff said in a news article that Jason was very quiet and just stared around the room. A pretty common response from the people that lose their memory. Everyone agreed that Jason would be released to his wife and they'd go home with their child. And that was the last story about Jason. But it's another story on the water regarding a fisherman who was presumed drowned. There's two cases for you today. Both times presumed drowned and they come back to life. What is going on here, folks? Remember, if you followed me for a while, I've always said this is about water. All of this is about water. And maybe these will start to bring you back to the fact that something is happening out there. We don't know what. It has the ability to manipulate our mind. And then it has the ability to give us our mind back at different intervals for different people. But you're going to start to see that different parts of the U.S. seem to have this more than others. Texas, Louisiana seem to have it a lot. Los Angeles seems to have it a lot. Indiana, Iowa, 
seems to have it a lot. I can't explain why. I can explain the California bit a little bit. And Louisiana and Texas, I mean, they're, they border huge bodies of water. Besides that, what else can move people hundreds and hundreds of miles without anybody knowing? Please share this on your social media. This is a topic that we're going to give extreme exposure to. Why? Because I think this is a corner point on this research. I think this may enlighten some folks as to really what's going on. And if you haven't ordered my movie, you can get it from me at our website, NA, like North America, NABigfootSearch.com. That's our online store. And we sell the DVD and Blu-ray to this, Missing 411, The UFO Connection. Thank you for being here. And remember, this is the kindness revolution. It doesn't hurt to be kind. It doesn't cost anything to be kind. And you'll feel better about your own soul if you're polite to people. And once you see their response, you won't forget. Thanks for being here. Politis out.